Okay, I'll start. Uh, welcome to the weekly colloquium series of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. Uh, most of you probably know what the Institute is about, but just uh, in one sentence, uh, our goal is to promote research in the digital transform to advance the digital transformation of society, business, government using AI, uh, cloud computing, machine learning, and Internet of Things. Uh, it's a consortium with many partners, C3.AI and Microsoft are the two companies sponsoring it. Um, Illinois, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Princeton, Chicago, and Stanford are the university partners. And we have two labs, the NCSA at Illinois and the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, before I introduce the speakers for today, I just want to mention there are a number of uh, talks, uh, many of the initial ones focusing on uh, the COVID-19 uh, problem. And many of these people are uh, people funded by our institute. Uh, so the next few speakers are Darona Samaglu uh, from MIT, Dimitri Bertsimas from MIT, Stefano Bertacci from Berkeley, Asu Osdagler from MIT, Zoe Rapti from uh, Illinois, Vince Poor from Princeton, Saurabh Amin from MIT, Sanmi Koyejo from Illinois, Raid Ghani from um, CMU, and Sindhil Mullainadhan and Ziad Obermeyer from Chicago and Berkeley. So uh, these talks will span a number of topics ranging from uh, mathematical modeling to societal resilience, uh, uh, many, many issues that we have to address during the ongoing crisis. So uh, I hope to see uh, most of you again for, for these uh, future colloquium talks. So let me now move on. Uh, oh, so before I introduce the speakers, uh, let me just say a few things about the format. The uh, talks, the three talks together will be about 40 minutes today. And, and there'll be a 15 minute question and answer session. And please type in your questions, questions in the Q&A box. And at the end, I will ask them to the uh, speakers. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, please go ahead and type them in and I can, I can wait till the end to ask questions. So you don't have to wait till the end to type in your questions. And you can upload a question if you like. So if there are questions that have more upvotes, then I'll give priority to them. And we may not be able to get to all the questions, but we'll try to answer as many as possible. So today's talk, the title is Network Epidemiology Models for COVID-19 Analysis and Control. And the speakers are three distinguished colleagues of mine at the University of Illinois, uh, Professor Carolyn Beck, uh, she's a professor in industrial enterprise systems engineering, and she has appointments in electrical and computer engineering, mechanical engineering, coordinated science lab. And she also serves on the Carl Illinois College Medicine Admissions Committee. Uh, Carolyn is an expert on control theory and model reduction in particular, and her application interests range from network inference to medicine. And, and I must say that uh, uh, all three of them are part of a, a project funded by our institute, and one of Carolyn's students is also a co-PI on this, on this uh, project, and he'll be starting at Purdue University as an assistant professor soon. Uh, Tamer Bashar is uh, 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 one of our most distinguished faculty members. He's an uh, expert on control theory and game theory. Uh, he has worked on many, many things, uh, uh, stochastic teams, games, networks, multi-agent systems, learning. Uh, he's also, I mean, control theory and game theory and, and communications optimization is author of many books. Um, Tamer has won more awards than I have publications, so I'll just mention one. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Our third speaker is uh, associate professor in the Department of Pathology, Professor Becky Smith. Uh, she's also uh, uh, in the Carl Woos Institute for Genomic Biology and uh, also affiliated with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, she is, her current research focus is on understanding the impact of data collection and propagation of errors and uncertainty through prediction. So it'd be really interesting to hear her thoughts on uh, the current statistics and modeling associated with COVID-19. So now I'll turn it over to Carolyn to start the uh, colloquium. Okay, so let me get my screen. 
All right, so um, on behalf of my co-speakers and myself, my co-speakers, uh, Professor Tamir Bashar and Professor Rebecca Smith, I'd like to thank the hosts for the invitation to present, present at the colloquium. And thanks as well on behalf of our entire project team. We, uh, Tamir and uh, Rebecca and I are half of the team. Um, and this is a team led by Prashant Mehta, who's uh, here at UIUC. Um, and also co-PIs Matt West, who's also at UIUC, and Philip Pare, who's at Purdue. So as we're all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a large effort and a large devotion of resources to research, focusing on developing a deeper understanding not only of the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, but also uh, more generally on um, mathematical modeling of epidemic processes and how to use data to both inform and validate these models. As well, um, there's, uh, there are many efforts looking at understanding more clearly and analytically how epidemics spread across arbitrary networks, for example, human contact networks or transportation or trade networks, um, and looking also at how we can uh, use the insights gained from uh, our, our developments in mathematic, mathematical modeling and analysis to inform control strategies um, so that we can suppress and or mitigate um, the spread of the epidemics as quickly as possible in the face of trade-offs such as those that were discussed uh, in the colloquium last week. And of course, a greater benefit is that all of these results will be applicable to other domains of interest that many of us share as well. Um, so a quick outline of the talk today, I'm gonna to give just a tiny bit of history at the start on epidemi epidemiological uh, modeling. And um, then I'll introduce a few classic epidemiological mathematical models. Um, and um, some of these will incorporate networks. Uh, to start, we won't, uh, but we'll look at how, a little bit at how these are derived and how they're connected. Um, then Tamir will discuss stability analysis of these models and how these relate to um, a term we're probably all becoming familiar with, a basic reproduction number um, for epidemic processes. And he'll also look at um, controlling epidemics and what some control strategies like for controlling these processes. And then Rebecca will finish with a discussion of um, applications of um, the previously discussed work to the COVID uh, pandemic and the use of data that is out there um, in doing so. And then Tamara again will conclude. Okay, so the mathematical modeling of disease processes is not new. Um, the earliest papers on the topic I'm aware of were published in 1760 uh, by Daniel Bernoulli. So one of the famous uh, Bernou Bernoulli members, one of the mathematical family of Bernoulli's. Um, Daniel Bernoulli studied the smallpox uh, virus. Um, he proposed an SIR or susceptible infected recovered type uh, model for smallpox. Um, I'll say a little bit more about what that is shortly. Um, and in his work, part of his um, reason for studying these processes was he was a big proponent of, of vaccinations. Um, and in fact, there were vaccinations uh, available at the time of uh, in Europe for smallpox. So he was a big proponent of these. So he was um, hoping to, I think, convince more people to consider taking this vaccine, although naturally people were pretty wary about this. Um, interestingly, um, it seems that China had developed these vaccines maybe, uh, or some vaccines um, 800 years prior to this. So. They're ahead of the game on that. Um, since that time, there have been, um, uh, here we go, a virtual plethora of different epidemiological models proposed of different disease processes. So we're just gonna take a quick look at some of these um, and try to understand how they're all related. And then we'll look at network versions. So the most basic epidemiological uh, model is the SIS model or susceptible infected susceptible model here, we assume that people are in one of two states. They're either healthy and susceptible or they're infected. Um, if they're healthy, they transition or they may transition to the infected state at some rate, which we denote by beta. And if they're infected, they will transition or may transition 
uh, back to the healthy or susceptible state, again, at some rate, gamma, which we refer to as the healing or curing rate. We refer to beta as the infection rate. Um, so what we have here in this box is a differential equation model that describes the dynamics of SIS processes over population. Um, so a couple of notes just about the notation. Um, I'm using S of T and I of T to denote the proportion of the population that is susceptible and infected at any given time T. And then I'm using this dot notation to, um, for the time derivative. So I dot of T is DDT of I and uh, S dot of T is DDT of S. So we're looking at the dynamical system equations that capture the population, uh, the evolution of the disease process in the population. And this is what's known as uh, one of the original Kermack McKendrick models. This was proposed by Kermack and McKendrick back in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, adding a recovered, or some people use both recovered and removed, uh, compartment to our models. Um, this allows us to capture immunity, or at least temporary immunity, uh, to disease processes. So here in this SIR, susceptible infected recovered model, again, a person may transition from healthy to infected at some rate beta, and an infected person may recover at some rate gamma, and acquire some immunity uh, if they remain in the recovered state permanently, that is if this delta parameter is zero. If delta is not zero, then we're assuming that the immunity is only temporary and then they would become susceptible again. So here, people are still either healthy or infected, but they can be healthy and susceptible um, or healthy, recovered and immune. Um, so a direct extension uh, of the SIR model then is what's known as the SEIR model where we capture the incubation period, so essentially some delay um, that people typically experience uh, from the time they're exposed to uh, a disease to the time that they actually start to exhibit symptoms. So we have this E or exposed compartment. Um, and I just want to note in the classic SEIR models, um, persons in the exposed state are assumed to be non-infectious. So it really is just capturing the delay. Um, there have been many variations recently of these models for COVID um, and many adaptations where some of these, uh, some of the models have been proposed, they assume that when they're exposed, they may also be infectious. Um, so alternatively, uh, what we proposed um, is to include directly or explicitly an asymptomatic compartment um, for the COVID models. Um, this would explicitly capture the state of a person being infected and infectious, but asymptomatic. Um, and we allow the asymptomatic persons, I guess, to transition to either an infected and symptomatic state. Um, so that's shown here or to transition directly to a recovered state, since it seems that some people say that they never really experience symptoms uh, with COVID, but they uh, test positive. And um, one uh, other additional parameter we have here is this parameter Q. So we use this parameter to model the split in the proportion of the population that um, becomes symptomatic versus asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, within a short time of exposure. Uh, to symptomatic, asymptomatic. Um, and again, we have this parameter delta, which if it's zero, it means that recovery gives us somewhat permanent immunity. If it's not zero, then it means that we may become susceptible again. And of course we know that with um, COVID, this is still not completely known or accepted. Um, and just as a small aside, uh, I just want to note that the SAIR models, the first that I, uh, saw the, this type of model. Um, they were proposed a few years back to model dang fever virus. I'm not going to say much about it. The models were different in structure in terms of what compartments can uh, transition to what compartments. Um, but Martin Grunel proposed those. He proposed three different SAI models to capture um, the dynamics of uh, uh, dang fever. So it's kind of interesting in and of itself, but we won't spend any time on that. 
So I want to look quickly at the derivation of these mathematical compartment models that we just saw. So these differential equation models that essentially capture the disease process with respect to proportions of the population. So to do that, I'm going to focus just on the SIS models, the susceptible infected susceptible models. So we're assuming that every individual or um, we might look at subgroups of population um, to be more abstract, I often just call these nodes. So we might consider a population of N nodes. Um, and we know that they're in one of two states, either infected or susceptible. If they're infected, we, we say their value is one. So node I is infected, it has value one. If node I is susceptible, it has value zero. Um, then um, if we wanna study the collective condition of the entire population or set of groups, um, we look at the string of all these um, binary values for these nodes, um, and we call that that collected uh, string uh, big X. So that is essentially what we refer to as the state of the system. So at any time t, we know the state of the system, that is who's infected and who's not. And we assume then that the state will transition from one collective condition to another. So I've given an example for uh, the situation where we have three nodes or three people or three subgroups. Um, so this transition uh, occurs according to a Markov process. So it's gonna be over a chain up to the end states. Um, and this is again for SIS models. If we were looking at SIR models, we would have Markov chains where we had um, three to the end states, um, for example. Um, so to study an epi a dynamic epidemic process in detail, we need then what we're saying is we need to study a two to the end state Markov process or Markov chain, which is somewhat intractable for large N. So um, what we go to instead is uh, a population dynamics type model. So how do we get there from here? Um, again, we're assuming beta is inf our infection rate and gamma is our recovery rate. Um, so we um, look at, rather than looking at each individual node collected in the state big X of T, we look at counts essentially. So we're gonna count the total number of infected and the total number of susceptible at each time T. So the total number of infected is N sub I, the total number of susceptible is N sub S. We assume that our um, birth and death rate processes are essentially equal. So we always have a population size N. Um, so we can then essentially say we know, since we know the infection rate and the recovery rate, we can state that the, at any time T, if we know we have N sub I number that are infected, then we know this is going to increase with some probability proportional to beta, our infection rate, times the numbers of infected and the numbers of susceptible. So that has to do with susceptible people coming into contact with infected people. Um, times this interval of time delta t. Um, this number of infected is going to decrease with some probability proportional to, of course, the curing rate or the healing rate. Um, and then that gives us essentially a somewhat stochastic model that reflects uh, the dynamics with respect to numbers in the population. When N is very large, so our underlying number of nodes uh, in our system or individuals or population groups, then we can apply Kurtz's theorem. Um, and this basically is a law of large numbers for Markov chains. And Kurtz's theorem tells us that as N gets very large, this upper stochastic model can be appropriately and fairly accurately captured by considering the proportions of the infected and susceptible, which I now have marked down below. And what we do then is we let delta T go to zero and we recover the um, population dynamics that we had before the kermack mckendrick um, SIS uh, dynamical system model. Um, the problem with all of these mathematical compartment models for epidemic processes, however, is that underlying the assumptions of um, transmission of infections is, uh, is an assumption that everyone's equally interconnected to everyone else. That is, we're basically assuming that there's complete mixing in the population, or we can say the underlying contact, human contact network or group contact network is a complete graph. 
And we know this is unrealistic. So alternatively, over the past uh, decade or two, uh, epidemiologists as well as engineers, largely in the um, computer networks uh, area, um, have looked at how epidemic processes spread instead of over complete graphs over uh, network structures that have essentially arbitrary uh, graph structure. Um, and of course, there are multiple levels at which we can then model these processes. We can look all the way down to the nodes being actual individuals and use human contact networks. We can look at aggregated population centers as nodes. We can look at countries as being nodes. And then as well, we can also take into account travel, transportation, and trade networks. Um, so as I said before, in the compartment models we've seen up to this point, we're assuming that the underlying contact network is a complete graph. Um, and alternatively, what we want to do is look at the case where the underlying topology of the contact graph is network, it is arbitrary. So if we assume that we have some other graph structure, then we need to capture this graph structure. We typically say we know something about it or we maybe can infer it. And um, then we say the nodes or the people or the population groups in the network are interconnected um, in a way that's defined by an adjacency matrix A where the entries of the adjacency matrix A define the, um, the, the interconnection strength between any two nodes. So, so they're the edge weights for the graph. Um, some of these may be zero. If there's no interaction at all, some may be quite large. If there's a strong interaction, some may be small. Um, so in this setting, then we want to understand how epidemic processes spread, right? When we take into account this graph structure. Um, and I just want to note, we are assuming these edge weights, the little a, i, j, are all non-negative. So we don't have ne negative uh, edge weights. Okay. So again, we have two main models, a, a two to the n state Markov chain type model and a continuous time model. Um, so in the, um, in the network model, again, we're gonna say, look at the nodes, X sub i. We're gonna assume that each node transitions from susceptible to infected to susceptible. Now uh, we would uh, look at a node transitioning from healthier or susceptible to infected, right, at a rate that's determined again by the infection rate beta, but also um, we take into account the strength of interconnection that uh, we have, so that node I has, to any of its infected neighbors, these X sub J, right? So the edge weights directly affect the transmission of the uh, disease or they directly affect um, the spread of the process. And then again, of course, we transition from the infected state to the healthy state at a rate gamma. So we can then again evaluate the full network population by considering a full to the end state Markov process. I'm not gonna spend much time discussing this. We don't really have time to get into it. It's similar to um, what we saw before. Um, the point is that, again, this is going to be a two to the nth dimension or two to the nth order model, which quickly becomes intractable. So what we usually use, we sometimes use a stochastic model in our work, but what we typically use is what, instead what's called a mean field approximation model, which I've shown in the box here. Um, so here we have a model where we're looking at the evolution of the probability that any node i is infected. So a little piece of i of t here represents the probability that node i is infected. What that means is that one minus piece of i represents the probability that the node is healthy or susceptible. So basically we're saying the probability of infection, the rate of change of probability of infection is dependent on sort of the susceptible group times the rate of infection times the connected infected group then minus the healing rate. So this is essentially like the SIS population dynamic model, um, but we're taking into account uh, the network structure and we're looking at the probability of infection at each node. Um, so just very quickly, how we get there, um, we could, uh, again, consider the condition of all nodes at a time t. So we have some x of t. 
then we can compute the probabilities that given the state of the system at time t, node i would transition from um, healthy to infected, proportional to our infection rate and our connection to other infected nodes, or it would transition from infected to healthy at some rate proportional to our healing rate. And again, we'd also have probabilities of given the state of the system of remaining in the healthy state if we start in the healthy state or remaining in the infected state if we start in the infected state. What we do then is we apply the total law of probability, um, take expectations, and we let delta t go to zero. And this gives us what we call the exact expectation dynamics. Um, so this tells us the uh, expectation of any node i uh, being infected at any time t. Um, so that's exact. We actually make one more approximation uh, to arrive at our mean field approximation model. Um, so if we just use a well-known identity that the probability of some event z occurring is equal to the expectation of its indicator function z, um, then we can transition directly to this. Um, uh, this would be a, a mean field model. This is going to be more of an exact mean field model. But we have this term, the CIJ term, which essentially captures a joint probability, or um, in the expectation model, it captures a covariance. So, so we have the joint probability of perhaps neighboring nodes XI and XJ being infected. Um, and what we do is we approximate that by the product of the probability. So that's making an independence assumption that's very likely unrealistic. Um, and so that's how we arrive at the mean field approximation model that captures uh, in an nth order model rather than a two to the nth order model. So we have one of these for each of our nodes. Um, the evolution of the system um, in terms of the rate of infection at each of the nodes. Um, and the, because of this approximation, this is essentially uh, an upper bound on the exact uh, approximation dynamics. And so these are the models um, Tamir is going to speak to in terms of doing stability analysis and control. Um, and uh, we've also looked at time varying versions of these models. So that is, we can assume that the nodes are moving or basically the adjacency matrix has some time varying properties. And we can also allow for heterogeneous uh, infection parameters. So if we're looking at different demographic groups, et cetera. Um, and so those are, as I said, those are the models we consider um, in most of our work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tamer who is going to discuss uh, stability, uh, equilibria, and control. Come here. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. So, so I'll pick up where Carolyn has left. It's, uh, in fact, going back to the uh, to the basic uh, SIS model. So I would like to uh, both aspects of both the compartmental model as well as the network SIS, and then uh, very briefly talk about possible uh, control problems that arise in this in this context. So uh, again, as you have heard, the 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 simplest possible uh, model uh, is the SIS model at uh, where S is the um, susceptibility, the, the susceptible uh, part of the population and, and I is the infected part and S plus I, uh, add, they add up to, to one. Now, the, uh, clearly this is a nonlinear model and, uh, and, and again, and uh, we can, uh, because of this uh, relationship that S plus I equals to one, you can, this actually reduces to only a single differential equation, which is nonlinear. And uh, so it's this one, which we can write in this form. So there's a linear part, clearly, and the nonlinear part. But the nonlinear part uh, definitely does not hurt us. It actually helps us because of the negative sign and the beta. 
So the uh, stability is determined by the linear part and, and clearly if beta is smaller than, than gamma, then, then this term is, is negative and at least the linearized part is uh, uh, asymptotically stable. And one can actually show that this is, you can allow beta even to be equal to gamma and, uh, and, and, and you have global asymptotic stability. So now the question is, so this is the case where the infection rate is uh, uh, below the, the recovery rate or the recovery rate is above the infection rate. Then you converge to an all healthy state. No, uh, none uh, of the people in the, in the population are actually, uh, they are uh, not infected. Now what happens if this condition is not satisfied? That is if beta over gamma is strictly larger than one, then, then uh, there is another equilibrium and this is called an endemic equilibrium, which may again makes the right hand side equal to, to zero. And, uh, and one can actually show because of, again, because of this, this negative term, uh, quadratic term, that when beta over gamma is, is larger than one, then we have a global asymptotic stability. So, so there is a very clear cut situation, which is determined by the ratio of beta to, to gamma. Now, when we go to the, uh, to the network model, then, the, then this is what, what Carolyn had on the, and, and justified based on some independence assumption and the mean field approximation uh, that the, uh, the infection probability at each node, and there's an underlying graph structure, and here I'm assuming that the graph is undirected, uh, it satisfies this equation, that, which is again a, a set of coupled nonlinear equation, you, one can write it in vector form in this form. And, uh, and again, there is a linear part and a nonlinear part. Note that the capital P here is in fact the diagonal of all the P's. And, uh, and uh, this again, P equal to zero, clearly is an equilibrium state. And so under certain conditions, which I'll have on the next slide, uh, this is globally asymptotically stable, and there is also, again, an endemic state. So the stability condition, again, I reproduced this vector form here, is determined by the eigenvalues of this matrix. And if the, if the maximum eigenvalue is, is, is negative, then you have one type of behavior. Actually, it turns out that that leads to a, a convergence to an old healthy state for all the nodes. And, and if uh, this is positive, then we have an endemic state. And, uh, and so this is related to what's known as, an, as a reproduction number or reproductive number in some circles it's called. And, uh, and it's uh, determined, so this condition is of course equivalent to this R0 being either less than or equal to one or larger than one. And, uh, and, and so this uh, slide summarizes the uh, stability properties of all these equilibria. If the uh, reproduction number is less than or equal to one, so, so one can also show that equal to one is also allowed, then, then the all healthy state, which is P equal to zero is globally asymptotically stable. If uh, it is, uh, this, uh, the largest eigenvalue is positive, and uh, so if it has uh, at least one positive eigenvalue, then we have global asymptotic stability of the endemic state and the endemic state can be uh, uh, explicitly computed in that case uh, in terms of the parameters of the problem, which are the deltas. A is, A is of course the elements of the adjacency matrix and the, and the betas. And then for some simpler graphs, then, then there are simpler expressions for P sub line. So here we have, a, I have a simulations of the endemic state for, uh, uh, again, an undirected graph, uh, the ring graph with about 20 nodes. Uh, convergence is pretty fast. And what you have here, the second graph is there's a Lyapunov function that one introduces in the stability analysis. And this shows how quickly the Lyapunov function goes to zero. And this is 
another uh, graph, this is a random graph with 100 nodes, and again, it's convergence to, to an endemic state and is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite um, uh, quick. Now, the, uh, this was all for uh, undirected graphs, but what happens if we have directed graphs, if we have a topology that's directed? The stability analysis and, uh, and uh, the classification of all the different uh, equilibria, uh, uh, it's, it's a much more complicated analysis in that case. Now, where uh, do such uh, directed graph topologies arise in this context? Uh, these weakly uh, connected digraphs, they capture scenarios where there exist connected components that collectively serve is an infection source, but they are not affected by the rest of the nodes. That's what the direction stands for. And uh, so the spread dynamics in this case, A is no longer symmetric, the adjacent matrix, and is, is again, that's uh, the only difference is that A uh, transpose enters here, and, uh, and the reproduction number, uh, basic reproduction number is given as the spectral radius of B inverse A transpose B in this case. So if the uh, uh, digraph uh, uh, is weakly connected uh, with n strongly connected components, then one can decompose this graph into a block upper triangular form. And, and this allows us to uh, obtain a sort of a quite precise uh, a characterization of different equilibrium equilibrium states. And I don't have time to go into the details of this, but, but let me uh, just uh, show you that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the differential equation that we had for the Bs in the, uh, can be written in this form, where the C sub I here is the input, input infection from nodes that are not in, uh, in G, but not in, in GI. So therefore, this is the, there could be to any particular node, there could be infection coming from outside in one direction, but not in others. So, so if, uh, if we have a source, if I node is a source, then, then this term, the CIT, would be equal to zero. And, and it will not be infected because it's uh, going, uh, uh, the graph, the flow is only in one direction. So P equal to zero is an equilibrium state and, and uh, clearly in this case, that is the QI is equal to zero. And uh, there is also an endemic state uh, as, as before, but the uh, somewhat more complicated. And, and the interesting part here is that in the case of uh, uh, strongly connected uh, graphs, which is the undirected ones, uh, we have either a, um, a, an all healthy state, all nodes are healthy, or uh, all nodes are endemic. That is, there is a positive probability of them being infected. Whereas in this case with directed, the, the difference here is that you could have situations of this type where some of the nodes are, uh, uh, can be cured completely, whereas some others are in an endemic state. And, and this is uh, uh, simply because of the directed nature of the, of the topology. And, and here is, is one example for the case when you have uh, only two uh, uh, compartments here, and the G1 is the source, and then the G2, it flows into G2, they are both strongly connected. And in this case, the stability conditions and the equilibria can be related to the reproduction numbers at each one of these uh, nodes. And, uh, and for example, if they are both the reproduction numbers are less than or equal to one in both of these, then P equal to zero, that's the all healthy state for both of them, uh, is the only possible. And, and then uh, you have the other situations, for example, if the reproduction number here is, is uh, larger than one, and this one is less than or equal to one, then we have two equilibria and, and one can, this depends on the parameters of the problem. And then the, the second equilibrium state is uh, zero for, the, for G1 and 
an endemic state for, for G2. Okay, so let me just, just quickly uh, go to the uh, uh, control of the, uh, of controlling the epidemics, uh, again, using SIS models. Now, as uh, we have shown, the, there are essentially three uh, sets of parameters. This is the curing rate, delta i, uh, for, each, for each node and in the network model. There is the infection rate, beta i, and there is the adjacency matrix, which tells us which node is connected to which node. So when control comes into picture, when there is the possibility of controlling the, the, uh, the epidemics, then one uh, can have a, a control over these three sets of parameters. One is uh, the possibility of quarantining, which means you play with the edges, the AIJs, and then you can, you can uh, essentially uh, eliminate some of quarantining, for example, or uh, reducing or eliminating mobility from one community to another. And uh, or between two communities. Another possibility is uh, patching or infection reduction, and and yet a third possibility is the antidote administration. So these this one is uh, uh, related to the beta i's, and this one related to the de delta i's. So so what I'm going to do very quickly uh, uh, propose a, a control, talk about a, a, a control model uh, where we are controlling the curing rates only. And, and so, so again, again this, is the, this is our basic model and we are controlling delta i's in order to uh, force, the, for example, uh, the epidemics to go to a, a converge to an all healthy state. So, so how can uh, such a control problem be formulated? So you have the state equation, uh, which is the one that the P satisfies. And then you have to have a cost function. And, and let's assume that the cost function is such that you have, uh, these are the design parameters and uh, you have a positive cost on, the, on P, so you want to minimize this term in a, in a weighted uh, fashion. And you also want to minimize the, the uh, uh, U itself. And, and uh, to the, because of uh, various uh, budget constraints or immunity constraints that one may have. And, and also uh, on, the, uh, on U, uh, which, is the, which is the delta, uh, you, you may have an upper limit and a lower limit. So, so this can be formulated as an optimization problem, which we have done. We have, first of all, uh, simplified this to uh, a, a problem where the nonlinear term can easily be left out and and this provides an upper bound for the optimization problem and then still the still the, we have a bilinear uh, optimization problem the product of u and, and p and then the solution is one can show that there exists a solution and the solution has a, a switching property that it's a bang bang type of control as to be expected depending on the parameters of the problem v i's and the and the c sub i's and uh, a and, uh, and these are the, the uh, expressions, which are uh, the P and, and Q in this case is the cost state vector. And, and these are all uh, standard sort of uh, uh, sufficiency condition as well as necessary conditions. In this case, both necessary and sufficient that uh, of the maximum principle or minimum principle. These cannot be solved in closed form, but can be solved numerically. So one uh, approach, of course, this leads to a time varying uh, controller, curing rates, controlling the curing rates. So what uh, uh, we have done is we have also looked at the static uh, uh, ones, which are time invariant, that leads to a, a natural uh, uh, optimization, uh, static optimization problem. But here is a simulation of the dynamic controller and, and which actually shows that there are multiple switches. And, and earlier it was conjectured that uh, going back to 1974, that a single uh, switch would be, would be sufficient, but 
but but our analysis shows that uh, that multiple switches would be needed if you want uh, optimality in this case. So I'm uh, going to skip this. I mentioned that there are static approaches to this problem where you assume that the control is a constant and, and solve an optimal uh, optimization problem in, the, in that case, and, and which uh, can, be, can be done and uh, with uh, also some approximation of the, of the cost functions. But, but I'll not go into the details of this. And, uh, and one thing that I want to mention is that uh, static and dynamic controllers, uh, they exhibit similar performances when the underlying graph structure is sparse, but the dynamic controller is far superior over uh, the static controller over dense graphs. So the underlying topology plays an important role in the decision-making process as to whether one should use a dynamic time-varying uh, queuing mechanisms or time-invariant ones. So, uh, and uh, so one, I'll, uh, this is actually my, my last slide before I turn this over to Becky. And uh, uh, one question is, uh, here the, the previous analysis has shown that the, the, if, you, if you assume the curing rates to be, uh, to be a kind of open loop in the control terminology that is a function of time or constant, then you have a well-defined optimization problem. But what happens to normally in control, we assume the deltas uh, to be the control to be a function of the state. And in this case, the state is the PIs. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we have a, a, a sort of a surprising result that we recently uh, uh, included in a, in a paper that appeared in, uh, in December. And uh, that uh, if you, uh, uh, using con constant controllers, uh, one can uh, show that you can drive the system to an all healthy, uh, equilibrium and that is uh, controlling the delta i's but if you take i's a function of p then stability is not possible and the health state is not reachable from outside the origin regardless of what you pick as your k where the where the k is the multiplying factor uh, in the control is a is in terms of this feedback uh, uh, term so, uh, next I'll turn it over uh, to, to Becky, who will continue with this slide. Thank you, Tamara. I'm going to bring it back around to the question of what does this mean for the current situation and how do we potentially use these uh, methods to inform policy because our goal for mo as modelers is to inform policy to do decision making based on an expected outcome and to better design our decisions around the science but policy needs to be based on recent information these models need to be built understanding what the system is and unfortunately some of the things that, that you were hearing about in these models were Assuming that we know, for instance, how the disease spreads at what rate and how these controls actually work. But one thing we know is that those are not perfectly observed. Uh, when we make a policy change based on a modeling recommendation, there will then be a slight delay before there is a behavior change. Although in the current circumstances, some behavior changes happened before the policy change. Uh, once the behavior change, the infection rates change because we have now controls introduced to the system. Then slowly the data change and then our model predictions can change. So the mathematics gives us global rules to understand what would a certain policy change, putting a control in the system do. But uh, we need simulations to give local predictions and we need to understand that we don't perfectly observe the system that we're in. You can go to the next slide. So our problem 
One of our problems is data lags, and you've probably heard a lot about this lately. Test results can be delayed. Uh, mortality is one of our best, uh, least biased indicators, but it's a lagging indicator. It's something that follows, in this case, weeks after a change in behavior. So one of our solutions that we're working on is real-time data assimilation. So trying to pull in data as it comes in and assimilate it into the model so that we can be constantly updating what our model is predicting. The other big problem that we run into is just the biases in the data. Limited testing means that tests are targeted to certain groups. In most of the country now, we're focused on diagnostic testing, that most people get tested because they have a reason to be tested, and usually it's symptoms or exposure which does not tell us what the state is of the entire population. It means that there are data are biased towards certain groups. We also know that if you think about those nodes as being locations, test availability varies by location, so the amount of data bias will vary by location. I was able today to go and get tested and it took five minutes because we have test availability on campus. Not every place has that. So it's going to change what the data mean from each place. There's also the problem that controls, these controls are not actually universal. They are uh, varied by location, uh, both in policy and in practice. So they might be applied to multiple places in policy, but in practice are implemented differently, but the locations are connected. So we have those connected graphs. So our solutions to these problems are designing our models to the data to have these networked meta populations. So you saw the networked populations. What we have is networks within networks. So we have communities that are connected by networks, but within each community, there is also a network. And that helps us to identify the key nodes for these controls and especially which populations need the control more. We also can use this to design better data collection to ask where would more testing help most? Uh, where do we need better data to come in? And then use that to design better control that we can then throw back to the policy people, see that implemented and see the changes coming out in the end and hopefully update our model so we have real time prediction of what will happen. And I'll turn it back over to Tamir for the conclusion. So um, the uh, so what we have discussed uh, is uh, very briefly different models of epidemic spread or uh, graph structures and and this was in continuous time and we have also results in discrete time and 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 which we can on a, a different occasion we could uh, we could share those and 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 we discussed in this colloquium there the equilibrium states and their stability which very much depend on the graph topologies and infection and healing rates and, and as a result of these, uh, uh, we could have all healthy states and various types of endemic states. As uh, I have shown in the in directed graphs, you could have some nodes being uh, converging to a healthy uh, state, whereas some others uh, could remain endemic. And, and also we discussed some selective ways of controlling the, the spread. There are many promising directions of research, and uh, all most of the results were on uh, SIS. And and Carolyn has uh, introduced uh, for you the SIRS, SEIRS, and SAIRS models. And there is also the possibility of looking into higher order models, and uh, that is by higher order I mean the not using our models are second order uh, because the mean field approximation uses an independence assumption, which brings in the product of probabilities. And one can actually look into higher order models there also. Uh, 
and the collection of data that is informative enough to estimate the parameters, to validate the models, and evaluate control policies, that's uh, uh, very important. That's an important aspect of our research also. And uh, the, another uh, interesting, both from a control uh, point of view, as well as from a, a practical point of view, application point of view, is, is it possible to control the spread uh, by playing with the inputs or the, uh, the rates, curing rates at selected nodes? In other words, you have a network and, and is it possible to control all states of the network from a single node, from a single uh, uh, location? And, and, and we have results in the recent results in, in, in that direction, which uh, were presented at the IFAC Congress. And then of course the policy restrictions enter into the control designs and the virus mutations come into play multiple viruses uh, and we have recent results on that also multiple computing viruses and and of course the one important uh, uh, aspect of all of this is that not everybody abides by the rules and and what would be the impact of this on the overall network structure its stability and so on so i'll stop here and uh, and and would be any questions uh, we would have to respond to. Thank you. I don't have a way to clap here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, nice talk. Uh, maybe I'll start off with a question. So, um, much of machine learning and data science, uh, there is this concept of uh, model complexity. So the more parameters you have in the model, uh, so you could have an SIS model, you can have a, um, you can add an R, you can add the A, you can add a network, you can, you can take into account people's mobility, you can take into account planes, you can take into account trains and so on. So, so at what point, I mean, is there much study in this area on, you know, given a certain amount of data, what is the most appropriate model? I mean, the, you, can, you can, of course, the more detailed the model is, the more accurate it'll be. But, uh, um, but given that uh, you have a certain amount of data, at least in the early stages of an epidemic, what model should one use? So I don't know who wants to answer this question. Uh, Caroline, do you, want, do you want to give it? A... I'll start and then I'll let uh, Rebecca finish. Yeah, I mean, this is essentially, it, it, when you're trying to identify parameters in dynamic models, we call it, you know, the parsimony principle, or it's well known as, in many fields, right? So you can only, um, for, for any number of parameters, you need a certain number of samples. Um, and that's assuming often that the sample data set is a random sample, which as Becky talked about, we clearly do not have. So even with a random sample, we need we had n parameters, we need at least two n samples. That's a very, very lower bound. So that is an issue. So to start, given the data we have and the information in the data, we need to start with the, the simpler, um, simpler models with fewer parameters. And I think maybe uh, Rebecca has something to add to that. Uh, that's close to what I was going to say that early on, as we have less data and we have less information, we need to go simple just because every error, potential error source that we introduce into our model, it propagates through to error in our outcomes. So every time we put in a fudged parameter, we run the risk of having a, um, an outcome that is not accurate. And we, we know that this is a problem in disease modeling. And we, as, as Carolyn says, we use the parsimony principle. You use the most compl complex model that you can properly parameterize. Thank you. Um, maybe I can ask one more question. I guess we are running out of time. So in the very, very early stages of uh, uh, epidemics, I mean, I'm assuming differential equation models at least mathematically tend to be correct and the population is 
large, but what, what, what happens when the infected population is very, very small? Like when, when an epidemic starts, what is a good model to use uh, to predict or to even know if there is an epidemic actually? I mean, how do you tell if it's a flu or whether there's some actually there's an epidemic going on? So is there, are there other models beyond the models we discussed today or? So I would say that uh, it's not necessarily that when the infected population is small that you need to move away from uh, these models. It's when the total population is small that these stochastic effects can take more um, effect. So I, I don't generally worry about a small infected population with these models. It's only when you get into small total populations. Like if I'm doing a model for a population of 100, I'd move into a stochastic model or an agent-based model because you can see the real stochastic effects there. I guess my point is that if, if you have a city of a million and only three people are infected, then fractions will be close to zero. And so I was curious about whether a, a, a more faithful stochastic model would be better than a differential equation model at that stage and you switch to a differential equation model at a later stage. But you're saying that that's not that's not what people have observed, at least in epidemiology, is that right? That's not been my my experience. I don't know if Carolyn or Tamara have other opinions on that. I, I, I think it's, obviously there's, I do believe there needs to be some sample size, uh, even to say anything stochastically, right? You know, you can apply statistics, we need some minimum sample size. I think maybe your question is, too, I think is, when the numbers are small enough, how do we even know something's happening? Right. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I, don't, I don't know if I have a really good answer for that. <laughs> that moves out of modeling and into um, field work epidemiology. Field work epi okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, that's, that moves into having good baseline data so that you can recognize a signal amidst noise. Yeah. I think the best would be to quarantine those if there is just a, mm -hmm. a small group of people and which which they have done actually I mean in the in Arizona and so on they you have parties and they they uh, found out that everyone who went to that party was infected so you can see them and this way you can isolate that part of the population mm -hmm. Shankar, do you have a question? I, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, you know, I want to relate your talk to uh, some of you must have heard uh, John Birch last week talk about trying to raise on uh, decisions on reopening parts of the economy on the basis of uh, these epidemiological models. And certainly that's a hot topic of discussion. So in light of some of the modeling questions that you raised, uh, you know, John, as you may know, is a valuable case you learned. You know, he had aggregate models of uh, economic activity by zip code. And these are now available on the web. And, uh, you know, so he had uh, studies of how to keep the rates down, but optimize the amount of economic activity. But I, I, I want to ask you, you know, if you had a more fine-grained question to ask about, you know, when you're reopening a public, uh, public transportation system, say in Uber, you know, how would you, how would you say, uh, how would you provide policy frameworks with a sense of how to reopen, uh, you know, parts of the island and economy in a way that both uh, it strikes this balance. You, you know, I think it's uh, you know, a false choice in the economy that's going mm -hmm. up. Uh, and, and I, I think all of the scientists agree about this. But I, I, want to get, I want to sort of tease you a little further on how in models can we really use, get the public thinking about it. Uh, or even, uh, let me stop it. I would uh, love to answer from all of you, any of you. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get all the question, but uh, but there are two aspects to it, Shankar. Uh, uh, one, one is uh, of course uh, you need a, if you are allowing people to travel, 
and uh, for example, you open business and 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 uh, and uh, in New York City, a place like New York City, transportation is a very important component there, and people are not people don't live very close to their trans, to their business locations. So people are going to to uh, transport themselves, and how do you so so it's it's a it's a multi it's a problem with multiple factors. The transportation network plays an important role in that case. Whereas if you are doing it in a smaller community like Champaign Urbana, let me say you open restaurants and so on, people are not that uh, they may travel but in their own, they don't use public transportation generally. And, and so that's a totally different story. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, how our models would capture scenarios of this, that type is that the, the adjacency matrix will be time varying in that case. Because, because you have the, the flexibility of uh, uh, eliminating some of the edges in the, in the network, like not mobility from one community to another if uh, if that's highly infected and uh, and so direct factors will come into play and also the time varying nature of these edges will come into play and then you bring a control on the top of that uh, having to uh, face with making decisions as to within some of course the uh, uh, constraints and and taking into account the opening of the economy and so on. What sort of hardships this will bring on people? So so you can model all of these things into your uh, optimization problem, optimal control problem, in uh, deciding on how to uh, design these edges in your network, and then for different uh, stability conditions. Multi-objective. Yes, yes. I, I, I was going to bring up in economics, there's an approach called multi-criteria decision analysis. Yeah. Where you ask the policymakers to weight the outcomes. So the outcomes might be deaths and they might be transportation networks and they might be uh, uh, slaughter plants being open. And you, you ask them to put put their priorities on how much priority they have on each of the different outcomes and you can optimize on the total sum of those weighted outcomes. Yeah. Um, it, but yeah. it requires policymakers to know what their priorities are. Yep. Utility functions. And such. Exactly. In a sense, in a sense the, the simple optimal control problem that I formulated that I discussed is these parameters weighting terms D, which multiplies the piece, different components of the piece. So who is going to come up with uh, what those values should be? That's the policymaker. And for different values, you see what the outcome will be, and then you present it to the policymaker, and then let him or her make the decision. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I think uh, we should probably stop here. We're about 10 minutes over already. So thank you. Uh, uh, three of you for giving a very nice talk and thanks for the discussion afterwards. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.